All right, well, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about some um, broader ideas uh, about some of the legal issues and uh, give a kind of a classic example that's uh, often put out. Uh, so let me see if I can share my screen here and we'll get this started. All right, <clears throat> so I wanna give a, a case that's fairly well documented uh, or very well documented um, and kind of give you an example of, of a general set of cases that occur, general set of conditions that occur. Uh, fairly common, um, and <clears throat> sort of what the outcomes are. And then try to expand that to, okay, things like this have much broader implication and reach than just the particular example that we're gonna give. Now, this is not directly related per se to, to, to human genetics. It's more related to human development, but um, really on the underlying ideas that are here will also have an impact on what we're gonna see in the future as far as human gene editing, um, and other, other types of things. Certainly some things we'll talk about later with some testing. So I just kind of want you to have the, uh, 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 you know, some additional information uh, about some of the laws and some of the ideas. So let's take this classic case, or a well-documented case, I should say. Uh, it's Davis versus, versus Davis. <clears throat> and this involves a couple who were both, <clears throat> excuse me, in the military. Um, and they met in Germany in 1979. Uh, they married a year later. Uh, they attempted to have some children and Mary experienced, experienced uh, several uh, epitic or fallopian pregnancies, which resulted in spontaneous abortions, loss of the, of the fetus, miscarriages. And um, they continued to try to do this. They, they moved to Tennessee after their military service. And there were five uh, more failed pregnancies uh, because of the damage that was being done and other things, the fallopian tubes on, on Mary were, were sealed. Uh, they continued to want to have children as a couple, as many couples do. So in 1985, they spent uh, $35,000 for some in vitro fertilizations through a, a clinic in Knoxville. Uh, in in 1985's dollars, that was a huge amount of money, okay? Uh, it's a, still a, a significant amount of money, but uh, at the time, that's probably $100,000 worth of effort at this point. Um, <clears throat> they did these fertilizations. Uh, again, they all failed. They didn't implant. Uh, and so they decided to wait and try later. Sure enough, within a few years, uh, they continued again, decided, okay, we're going to try one more time. Um, they had nine ova retrieved. Okay, so they went in. They went ahead and fertilized these with junior sperm so that they would have a couple of things. They implanted two of them, both of these failed. This left seven of them, which were cryogenically preserved. Okay. Well, through the, you know, the trauma of all this and just the trauma of life, um, they eventually started to having marital difficulties. And Junior filed for divorce and it was, you know, the divorce process moved on, everything was, was settled except for the uh, disposition of these fertilized ova, okay, these embryos. And that started to started a, a major court battle. Uh, Mary wished to implant the embryos and asked the court to allow her to do this implanting as well as if they were successful that Junior would pay future child support. Junior wanted the, the embryos preserved, remain preserved, but, but not implanted, obviously, and ultimately destroyed. Now, preservation time for fertilized uh, ova is is determined. Uh, there's a legal. Some states have legal precedence on it. Uh, others have just clinical precedence, and some it's just it's just mechanical. Uh, there's about a five year window uh, with with most preservation times where you have you'll maintain them, and they may have some chance of viability. Okay, so generally it's about a five-year plan, all right? So we've gone along. We ha now have these fertilized units. Um, we've tried to implant those. They haven't worked. We've got some left. Uh, so now who has the rights to these, okay? Uh, Mary claims that she has the right, you know, as a mother and as it being part of hers, uh, that it was part of the relationship that was started. Uh, Junior says, no, I don't think that's, you know, that's not what I want to be done. It might be something we might reconcile and something, but right now that's not what I want to see happen to, to my contribution to this. 
So of course it goes to court, right? So what do you think? Uh, here's basically information. If you were sitting on a, in a jury, this wouldn't be a jury trial, but if you're sitting in a jury and this is what you're given, okay, what would you do? And, you know, let's think about it for a moment. So you've got this, these uh, fertilized ova, um, but some small potential, but even though there's been a lot of failure, still some small potential that it could be implanted successfully. Um, and, you know, should Mary be allowed to do that? And if she is allowed to do that, should Junior be then responsible as, as the paternal, paternal unit? Well, this obviously went to court and there were several discussions. This is what becomes important about this. Okay. The divorce court, the divorce judge said, no, Mary owns these. Okay. These are the awards or at least custody, just like you would children. You no, know? go to divorce court. Um, it was almost all, there's sometimes joint custody, which, you know, occurs. Uh, but many times there is one parental primary custody. Uh, the mother may win custody or the father may win custody or whatever. Okay. Now, the, this was a lot because there was a lot of discussion in the court about this. Um, Jerome Lejeune uh, was actually one of the individuals that came apart. He's a French scientist. And uh, he actually was, uh, was allowed to do a deposition. And his deposition argued that um, the, the important part of this is that uh, early stages after about four, sta four cell stages, these were embryos. And that was kind of what the argument was. It was, what's the difference in a pre-embryo and an embryo, okay? In other words, this is where the ruling is going. The judge was ruled that embryos are instances of life. They're children in vitro, okay? In vitro, you know, test tube, uh, so that they were, they were forms, okay? He argued this. Now, this level of, of when an embryo, it's a very important piece of terminology, versus a pre-embryo, was at odds with the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And it's, it still remains uh, so at odds. So, you know, one person's arguing, the reason I have Downs 2N plus 1 is this is the individual who actually uh, first realized that uh, trisomy 21 was, was primary cause of Downs. Um, but so he was, you know, a famous uh, geneticist. It wasn't just somebody they, they pulled out of the woodwork. Um, and he's saying, well, no, they're embryos, okay? We need to call them embryos and reform. Um, the, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine's defense was no, that's not who in this country we define uh, as embryos. We would call those pre-embryos, those early stages where these were arrested. Obviously they had been fertilized, but they were arrested two cell stage or maybe at a four cell stage. Uh, these are pre-embryos, okay? Um, and they, sh you know, they're, they're not embryos. But either way, the judge awarded Mary custody, and she said she would be allowed to implant them. Well, you know, it never, it, in a local court, that's never generally where these very complicated cases stop. So it moved forward, and Junior took it to the uh, state appeals court, the appellate court of Tennessee, and uh, they listened to the whole uh, scenario, listened to the cat, the uh, of various types of, of advice about it, and they rejected it. They said uh, they rejected the divorce judge's ruling. They said this is not a right to life rationale. Okay, uh, it's inconsistent with state law. State law in Tennessee at the time so it does allows abortion following Roe v. Wade. Um, so it's inconsistent with that. Okay, and that's important because of the some of the wording that's found in Roe v. Wade. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And very importantly. It said that Junior had the right not to be a father, okay? Uh, he had a right not to be a father, right? Uh, now that's based on the fact that this was not an implanted and growing organism, okay? These were, these were um, just, you know, cells essentially. So these are, these are uh, pre-embryonic stages. So basically they were agreeing that these are pre-embryonic stages. So what did the court do? It awarded joint custody. And, but what it did was it, in almost many of these cases, this isn't the only one, they really kind of leaked to the question of whether embryos are property or whether they're, they happen to be persons, okay? Uh, and there's a big difference between those two, those two ideas. Um, as you can imagine, they didn't stop here, okay? Uh, it moved forward, it went to the Tennessee State, State Supreme Court, 
Now, really, by this time, uh, the, it got to the court in 92, which is you know, many years later, uh, they actually both had their own relationships and you know, it, was, it was a bit more complicated and, and, and Mary was unlikely to be actually wanting to uh, uh, implant them, but it still can carry forward. Okay, so the Supreme Court of Tennessee uh, supported the lower court decision that uh, Junior had a right not to be a father. Okay? And basically, this comes from a series of, of, of precedents. If a person has a right to procreate, then they have a right not to. Okay. Now, now this, you know, this wasn't a case where you had uh, a child, you know, in, in fetal stage in development, okay, and, and it's going to become a, a living human. This is this is a, a pre-stage. Um, this is falls under the privacy implications under the Bill of Rights, uh, which goes back to things like Griswold versus Connecticut back in 65, so you know, 20 something years before that, uh, Griswold, Connecticut was where the, uh, the, the married couples could in fact um, acquire contraceptives, okay? Like, oh my gosh, I thought we could always have contraceptives, but it, no, not legally in, in some states. And so this said that there was marital right to privacy and the right to privacy uh, that was put in the Bill of Rights cover things such as reproductive privacy and, and uh, contraceptive privacy. This was an important case that was also used in Roe v. Wade, okay? Uh, now, unlike abortion, males have rights to free embryos. This is something we, we, we covered earlier, okay? So uh, they have rights. Males don't have rights in abortion, right? Uh, they, they, they didn't. Um, and you know, being an unwilling parent places financial, emotional, and legal burdens. That's very true, right? If you go along and, and you have this and then somebody implants something uh, and 10 years later asks you to provide support uh, that in your, you know, you're not emotionally involved or emotionally set. So uh, they did. Now, <clears throat> what the court then ruled was that they were neither persons or property, okay? Which was an interesting outcome of this. They occupy a position of special respect because of their potential for human life, right? So they ruled that they were neither one. They were not property, okay? You couldn't claim them as, as, as ownership and that they weren't persons. And that's a very important term, okay? Now, however, because there is Roe v. Wade exists, okay, and still exists, um, and a number of other rulings, free embryos, which is what they basically decided they were, fall into a class of the unborn and do not have rights of individuals. In other words, uh, these pre-embryos, whether they were implanted or whether they were in a test tube, uh, are not persons. They do not have personhood. Okay? And, and that was a very important outcome from this. All right, so we've had this case, um, and you know, by now, it's 92 anyway, the, the viability of the embryos is probably uh, past time or, or close to it. And so they, they move ahead with uh, the removal. All right, now, so what? Okay, so you have this. Well, one thing, this is a common thing, as I said, um, and various fertility clinics, various states, uh, government systems, um, have rules about this, okay? So if you go into a fertility clinic and you extract ova and, 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 and sperm and you, it does then, uh, if you know, depending on the state, which may not have any rules, it may be dependent on the reproductive uh, clinic. You may have to, you sign a waiver or you sign something and it happens. This has happened a number of times. There've been a number of divorce cases that come up where there was existing cases. Very famous case in, uh, uh, Australia, where there were fertilized ova that were in storage for a couple who were killed. Uh, and, you know, what, what, what did you do, right? What rights did you have? And, and, and there's been all sorts of cases where one of the potential parents was, was killed or, 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 you know, passed away and the other one there or both were gone. And, and so, anyway, there's been a bit more codification of this going on. Uh, in 2002, th there was an interesting part of this, which was the, the Born Alive Incidents Protection Act. And this was an act by Congress. Uh, it was passed by the House and then the Senate and then signed by the President, which in, in August of uh, 5 of 2002. And it basically said that it was, it was doing two things, okay? One, it was trying to define what a person was, okay? What, what a person was. And by this act of Congress, uh, a person is every infant member of Homo sapiens, so our species, who is born alive, okay? 
at any stage of development, right? But it's critical that it says born alive. Uh, paragraph B, which I haven't included here, but you can look up, discusses what being born alive means, okay? And it means that they are able to breathe, they're able to function on their own. They, 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 they can be brought to that at any stage, as it says, um, which means that, you know, they, they, it, it could become from a cesarean. It can be from a natural birth. It can be from an abortion. Uh, if it's late, late term, which, you know, it's not going to happen. Uh, the, the stories about that are just, you know, uh, rarely correct. And, but if you do, and the, the infant is breathing, then, then it's a, then it's a, person. It's a human being. It's, a, it's an individual. Okay. Now notice that it, in section C, it says nothing in section is construed to affirm, deny, expand, or contract any legal status to any member of the species prior to being born alive. It's just saying they're born alive. Okay. So the real purpose of this was to, to kind of stop what was thought of as late term abortions, right? Things where um, you had individuals who had to be brought out and put into an incubator or something could have lived, right? Okay. Um, now, this is all part of this, this concept of things like uh, fetal rights and this whole idea of personhood laws. And that's where I wanted to also take this discussion. Okay. Um, fetal rights are this idea that, uh, that fetuses, okay, that, that embryos, uh, have rights. Well, so what, what's an embryo and what's not an embryo, a pre-embryo? Well, it depends on where you are in the world, okay? Um, in the U.S., uh, it's currently accepted in, in, that um, it's about two weeks uh, is the period after fertilization, uh, which takes you from, you know, first few divisions and all the way up to probably a blastocyst stage, which is right at the ability to implant. So about two weeks, uh, that's pre-embryonic. Okay? Uh, once they, it's, it's past the two weeks, three, four weeks, and it's starting to implant, then that, it, that becomes an embryo, and then fetal development continues. Okay? Uh, why is that important? Because pre-embryonic okay, um, is not a person, it's not a living functional thing. And so in fertility clinics and things, they, those, those have their certain rights or certain uh, things that you can do with that versus what uh, you would do, say, with, a, with an abortices, an embry embryo, full embryo. Okay? Um, now, that, does, that varies. So Germany has, says, no, nope, uh, you know, anything, basically any fertilized ova is a fetus. Um, and other countries have other, other different rules. But in the U.S., it's about two weeks, okay? Now, all of this has led, and the reason that we went back to a moment ago about no personhood back up here, is that there has been for a long period of time since essentially Roe v. Wade back in the early uh, 70s, there have been uh, attempts of obviously to, to, to remove that, okay, there, and there are uh, anti-abortion people. And they have attempted to remove it, but because, you know, the Supreme Court has ruled, uh, and many states have, have uh, laws permitting it. Uh, it. It's a difficult thing to remove without going all the way back to the Supreme Court, uh, having them reverse uh, decades of decisions. Um, so what they've done is primarily tried to go around by what are called personhood laws. And personhood laws then assign as to, to embryos uh, that they're living persons, they're humans. They, 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 okay? Now that's not what this says here. That's not what the legal definition of a, of a person is under U.S. code. However, certain states have gone and have done this because of Part C, which is, you know, they can expand um, on contract the legal status. So they have actually tried to do that, or in some states have actually done it, and have declared what are called persons, okay? Now, that brings up a whole suite of things, right? Now, while that might be good, you say, okay, I'm trying to protect the fetus that are in the embryos, okay? Um, the, you know, and that they're their people, um, you know, it, it just, it's, it's a whole collective of things. What it's basically trying to do is circumvent Roe v. Wade. I mean, you might as well be honest about what your, what personhood laws are about. They're basically a way to say, no, this is a living person at stage two, stage four development or whatever. And if you, you're killing it, okay, you're, you're committing murder if you do things. And the state of Alabama has, has a law that's uh, currently being contested that was passed in, uh, 
2019 regarding uh, abortion, kind of one of the strictest in the nation. It's still being contested, uh, but it was signed by by Ivy, our governor, and it has to do with basically this idea that if you, you know, uh, it's committing murder for the most part, unless there's two physicians that say that it's absolutely necessary for this mother and a few other caveats. Um, so the, these person things, though, they lead to a whole bunch of of outcomes that, that you, you know, when you pass these types of laws, they, they really lead to consequences. Um, and so the consequences are if, if, a, if an embryo or pre-embryo is a person, then they have rights, okay? Now, the question then becomes a very huge legal argument about how many rights they have. Are they fully protected under the Constitution? Are they people, human, you know, are they, are they complete? Uh, system. This says they're not until they are born alive. Okay, that's what this this clause is about here. Um, but if they are, okay, and they have full person things, then of now there are things that are persons, right? In 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 uh, legal jargon, uh, corporations are persons. You've heard that in pro and con, but they they are considered as they have some rights that would be attributed to an individual. Okay, um, but if you take this to a full person, then, you know, it leads to some really interesting questions. Uh, questions like, uh, and, and some of them may sound silly, uh, but, you know, once you open the slope, you open it. Uh, if a pregnant female goes into a bar, is, is that admitting a, you know, is that admitting a, a, a juvenile to a bar? Sounds silly, but, you know, there. Um, if, if a female uh, takes aspirin, uh, or takes a flight, or does something else, which are known things that can cause lead to spontaneous abortions, uh, miscarriages, and they have a miscarriage, uh, and they took aspirin, did they commit murder? You know, uh, and it sounds silly, but that's really what the kinds of things that you would have to think through. Um, and does a does a embryo have have rights? You know, can they sue? Like obviously they can't vote. We have voting laws till you're a certain age, but but could they sue? Could you sue on behalf of, you know, an embryo of a fetus? Um, and so we, we, you know, something we kind of already discussed in other ways, but the, um, it, it just leads to this whole litany of, of, well, if they're humans and they're wandering around, then there's mother's possibly saying, well, that's never going to happen. Well, it already has. I mean, um, there are laws about um, alcohol and uh, drug use uh, by mothers, uh, by the females, and the effects on the fetus, and whether those, you know, they can be, they can be illegal in various situ in certain situations if something happens to the fetus. So you've already got laws out there that says well, the mother's responsible, and this is, you know, this, this is the, the effect. So you, it doesn't take a lot of thought to say, well, we could expand that to, well, I think we should protect this or this. So my, my whole point is here, going back, is that, yeah, there's these, these cases, and there are lots of them, uh, they have, you know, they lead to certain outcomes, but often uh, what's interesting about them is that they, they lead to much broader discussions, right? And the broader discussion here is this idea of property versus persons and, and it, how it relates to the protection of uh, these individuals and how, you know, whether and what they are. And so, and there are all these codes out there. So if you're going into to medicine, uh, you're going into a legal, you know, law that involves uh, um, divorce law or whatever, human law, uh, or you're going into things like genetic counseling, um, or you're going into, you know, forensics. These are kind of laws and ideas you need to understand, and they vary, you know, they're very important to understand them in your state uh, versus the federal system versus whatever country you may end up in, okay? All right, so that concludes what I wanted to say about that, uh, and we'll talk about some more legal issues uh, uh, in the next little series.